latest topic uh, from radiology i hope everyone did well because all the course all the 40 questions i chose were from the previous year topics which are very very important for inact exams so it is mandatory for you everyone of you to know all these questions and make it correct so that it will be easy for you to score good ranks in inact exams so i hope i am audible right if you are having any doubt please let me know in the chat box uh, i will be watching the chat box also so please let me know in the chat box so if you are ready then we can start the session so shall we start so this was the first question so this first question was a case of a 20 year old who presented to the er uh, with the chest pain after road traffic accident so the patient is coming to you after road tra traffic accident the patient is complaining chest pain and as a casualty medical officer you are doing a e fast okay so what is the diagnosis this is a question so this was a question which we already discussed in our INSAT recall section because it was a repeat question and so that we should understand some basics about all these things first of all we should understand what is fast so fast stands for focused assessment with sonography or trauma so in casualty or in an emergency room who is doing this first so the casualty medical officer in charge or whoever it is who are in charge can do the ultrasound okay who can do the ultrasound so in fast what we will do is we will do ultrasound and four quadrants okay so we will do ultrasound in four regions first one is the epigastric region so what will you look in this epigastric region so in the epigastric region you will keep the probe here and you will look for any pericardial effusion or pericardial uh, hemor hemorrhage like pericardial tamponin etc so that is the first thing so first you will look this epigastric region to look for any pericardial tamponade then you will look into the right flank this right flank and in right flank you will see the morrison's pouch so what is morrison's pouch morrison's pouch is the space between liver and right kidney so it is one of the most dependent part when the patient is lying down and so you should look for or uh, the free fluid in morrison's pouch so you will look for any fluid present in the morrison's pouch in right flank region in left flank region there is kidney so sorry there is left kidney as well as there is spleen so you should look for any injury to the spleen or left kidney so that there will be any free fluid or collection around these organs you should rule out okay and finally you will see this pelvis region finally you will see the pelvis region so this is how you do the e fast uh, sorry fast so first you will keep the probe here you will look for any pericardial effusion or pericardial tamponade then comes to the right flank region you will look for the morrison's pouch you will see whether there is any collection or whether there is any free fluid between the right right kidney and liver that is the morrison's pouch then you go to the left side you will see the spleen you will see any collection around spleen and finally you have to go to the pelvic region which is one of the most dependent part when the patient is lying down okay so if there is any bladder injury or any other peritoneal or mesenteric injury there will be free fluid collecting in the re pelvis region so all the four regions are very important when you are doing a fast okay so now it is modified into e fast that is extended fast where you will look the lung fields also and you have to look for two things one is pneumothorax and another is pleural effusion that is hemothorax or pleural effusion okay so all these things you can do in casualty set of itself, uh, in casualty itself so that is the importance of fast so fast is done by the casualty medical officer who is in charge so the, he will examine the uh, abdomen in four, uh, he will divide the abdomen into four quadrants he will examine the abdomen into four quadrants he will look for all these things and in extended fast they will see the lung fields also so they what they will look is they will look for pneumothorax as well as hemothorax that is or pleural effusion so this is the concept of fast and e fast so this is an uh, ultrasound image in which in the top portion you are able to see multiple linear lines like this and in the bottom we are able to see multiple sand green like appearance so this is just like the wave and the water and the sand in a seashore so this is known as the seashore sign which is seen in 
normal length so here the patient is having nothing here the patient is not having any pneumothorax so the answer for this question was normal image okay so the answer was normal image see so whenever you are going for inct you should be prepared for normal as well as abnormal things because they can ask you they can trick you they can make you fail uh, simple because don't think that since it is an exam there will be uh, definitely there will be pathology don't ever think like that always remember sometimes they can give you normal images like that so it is very important to identify c short sign which is seen in normal length i hope that is clear okay so you will see the barcode as well as sand grains like this that is why it is termed as c short sign so pneumothorax as i or as i told in my previous session pneumothorax is very 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 important for your inct so you should know all the aspects about pneumothorax you should know the treatment you should know what you should do how it appears in ct how it appears in x ray how it appears in ultrasound every aspect is very important so the plain radiograph it is the most commonly done investigation it is the most commonly done investigation for pneumothorax so the three important points you should see the three important things that you should three, uh, see for pneumothorax in plain radiograph first is hyperlucent hemithorax hyperlucent hemithorax see this side, right side is pretty black it is very hyperlucent because it is filled with the air okay some sometimes you will see a collapsed lung also here you are not able to see the collapse length here it is completely filled with air second thing you have to see is absence of vascular markings okay that is the second important point you should see for look for the absence of vascular markings see here you are not able to see any vascular markings but even here if you see you are able to see all the vascular markings of pulmonary hilar vessels so it is beautifully seen here so second thing you have to see is you have to look for the vascular markings and finally you should see for the deep sulcus sign okay finally you should see for the deep sulcus sign so three important things you have to look for in pneumothorax in a plain radiograph is hyperlucent hemithorax with absence of vascular markings and deep sulcus sign if any of these present then you can confidently say that is pneumothorax it is a very much important uh, clinically important thing because you should never miss this in your emergency room or casualties okay because you should act promptly you should act intervene you should intervene promptly when you are seeing a pneumothorax and if you are doing an e fast you will get this complete barcode like appearance you won't see any show any grants only barcodes will be seen so we will term this as stratosphere sign or barcode sign okay so that is the importance of stratosphere sign or barcode sign and if in the question uh, if the question comes like Chest X-ray was apparently normal, but the clinician was uh, suspecting pneumothorax. Then what you should do? Then you should definitely go for CT chest. Okay, because CT is very sensitive for finding out air. It will be seen jet black, like this. Air will be seen as jet black appearance. The HU value for air will be between minus 300 to minus 1000 in this range. Okay, so even one ml of air we will be able to see in CT. Because it is that much sensitive for air. So if you are suspecting minute pneumothorax, then definitely go for CT. Sometimes when the bulla ruptures, there will be only from ML, 4 or 5 ml air will be there. All in the, all those conditions, CT will be very helpful. Okay. So remember, whenever you are suspecting air, CT is the investigation of choice. It is very sensitive for picking up minute amount of air then you should know the treatment part you should know where to put the icd what is triangular of safety in what have what you do in cases of uh, tension pneumothorax all these things are very important okay what you will do in case of tension pneumothorax because in tension pneumothorax what happens is because of pneumothorax this air will compresses the vascular column it will compresses the blood vessels resulting in hypotension so in tension pneumothorax the patient will present with hypotension so if you don't act quickly what happens is the patient will collapse so immediately you have to put the a whiteboard needle and let the air out so where you should put in adult where you should put in pediatric air group age group all these are important because in adults we will usually put it in fifth intercostal space whereas in pediatric age, age group we will put it in the second intercostal space so all these are the treatment part which has been already discussed in our previous session please go back see this before you go to your inct exams because without knowing hemothorax sorry without knowing neuromothorax you can't get a good rank in inct
so this is another quest because this uh, aims people uh, since they are, uh, are being sophisticated they will be asking you about mri and sequences of mri definitely they will ask this in every each and every uh, exams so you should have a strong concept about the routine mr sequences that we use so this was a question this is a very easy question regarding this so this was a case of a 55 year old male who presented with acute onset of right side limb weakness as well as slurring of speech so from the history itself we can understand that the patient is having cva for three hours so patient is having stroke or cerebrovascular accident for last three hours so immediately you make the diagnosis in emergency room immediately you send the patient for ct or mri here the mri image is given so find out the wrong statement so that is the question so you have to see the mri image you have to find the wrong statement. so the first option is diffusion restriction region is seen in left frontoparietal region that is the first option so we have to go the image you go to the image you have to check the image so you are seeing the image you are seeing some bright regions like this so you are seeing some bright regions like this so you know this is bright so they are this is a diffusion weighted image which is the most sensitive sequence for cva for finding out an infarct, diffusion weighted imaging, diffusion weighted sequences are the most sensitive sequence. It picks up an infarct within 30 or 40 minutes. So it is the first sequence to pick up. So whenever they are asking about stroke, the most important thing is diffusion weighted images. Okay, DWI. That is the most important thing. So what happens is here there will be infarct. So what happens in infarct is there will be cytotoxic edema. What happens in infarct is there will be cytotoxic edema okay there will be cytotoxic edema so in this region of cytotoxic edema the water molecules will not be able to move freely but all in all other regions the water molecules will be freely moving okay in, in our body is uh, 75 percent of the body is made up of matter water and these water molecules will be freely moving here and there but what happens when there is an acute infarct is there will be cytotoxic edema so it won't allow water molecules to move freely it won't allow the water molecules to move freely so this region will appear bright in diffusion weighted images okay that is why we are able to see bright appearance in dwa sequences okay so this is the basic concept and also remember there are multiple lesions showing diffusion restriction so we already know the mnemonic it is i and me I stands for infarct, A stands for abscess, stands for medulloblastoma, and uh, our meningioma, and E stands for epidermoid cyst. So all these lesions in the brain can show restricted diffusion. So these are some of the lesions that are commonly seen in the brain showing diffusion restriction. This is very important because if in the question, any of the lesions are showing diffusion restriction, then you should think about this infarct, abscess, medulloblastoma, meningioma, or epidermosis in brain. Okay, so the first statement is correct. Now, the second statement is region involved is left anterior cerebral artery territory. So they are telling this is a left ACR territory infarct. You should see that. So you have to understand that the brain, the medial most half of the brain, near this uh, sagittal, uh, the parasagittal region, is supplied by anterior cerebral artery whereas the lateral area is supplied by the middle cerebral artery okay so if you see the image you have to understand that this is a region that is supplied by mca not aca so this was the answer for this question okay so the medial portion of the brain is always supplied by the anterior cerebral artery whereas the lateral portion so that is why since it is an mca in fact that is why the patient is having slurring of speech because mc middle this middle cerebral artery supplies the broca's area wernicke's area uh the area for low upper limbs etc so that is why the patient is having slurring of speech so the second option is wrong and we all know when you are having an infarct and when you the when the patient is in the window period that is a, a period of less than four hours we can go for either I, I intravenous or intra arterial thrombolysis so that is correct we can use alteplase or tenetic tenetic place you know that and 
when there is a large vessel occlusion because of thrombus you can have endovascular cord retrieval so all these statements are correct except the second one second one is the infarct is in middle cerebral artery tertiary so you have to understand that this tertiary is supplied by the posterior cerebral artery this part the medial portion is supplied by the anterior cerebral artery and the lateral most portion is supplied by the middle cerebral artery so these are the vascular tertiaries of the brain and you should be thorough with this thing okay so this is about the, the diffusion weighted images now coming to the other things you should know how to find out each and every sequences this identifying the sequences was once asked when uh, during 2018 19 on uh, on those three years before three or four years back they used to, to ask you to identify the sequences still they can ask you so you should know how to identify the sequence so first we will see one by one so the first image okay so first image we will go step by step first we will see the csf the csf is appearing see this is a csf csf is appearing black then you have to see the white matter i, I told you brain is just like a cut open coconut inside we have water then white matter and then gray matter so this is the white matter here the white matter is appearing white and gray matter is appearing gray so white matter is white and gray matter is gray so when the fluid is black white matter is white and gray matter is gray then the sequence is t1 so this is t1 weight image so this is how you will find the sequences just look three things okay second we will see so the csf appears white here so when the csf is white then only one answer that is t2 okay so the concept is very simple when the csf is bright then there is only one thing that is t2 but you have to show the white matter the white matter appears gray the gray matter appears white so the white matter appears gray and the gray matter appears white so that is just opposite okay and so again similar the fluid is black the black so csf is black here high point and sweet tail and the white matter is gray again gray matter is white so white matter is gray gray matter is white again opposite of t1 and the but the fluid is appearing high point and so that is flare flare is very very important because flare is usually uh, routinely they ask flare they will give the image of flare because you will easily get confused between t1 and flare that is why they usually give you the flare image and flare is very useful for finding out the blocks in multiple sclerosis flare is an excellent sequence that help you to find out multiple sclerosis okay that is why it is important the final one is very very important it was a repeat question from last year because they gave you the uh, image of susceptibility weighted images and they give you multiple micro bleeds okay because the micro bleeds will be seen in diffuse axonal injury so this diffuse axonal injury can be diagnosed with the help of one sequence known as susceptibility weighted imaging okay so swa is very very important so you should know how to find out t1 how to find out t2 how to find out flare and how susceptibility weighted images and bleeds will be seen bleeds will be black black spots so that is called as micro hemorrhages punctate micro hemorrhages it will be seen black okay the bleeds will be seen as black so you should be very thorough with the t1 t2 flare swa twa so five sequences you should be very thorough okay so read all five these five sequences okay before you go to your exam it will help you a lot not only in your exams but also in your future practice because mri is one of the mainstream that help you to make diagnosis in different fields so you should have it whether you are taking radiology or not that is a different part even if you are a clinician even if you are a, 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 a neurologist or even if you are a, a neurosurgeon whatever it is you should be very thorough in mri okay so it will help this concept will help you in your future so these are the main sequences that help you to find out findings okay now the other simple question so this is a case of a, a the patient hip radiograph of a patient with a severe hip pain is given so i have not given whether the patient is male or female but the patient is coming to you with a severe pain you have taken an x-ray radiograph apv of the hip and what you are seeing is you are seeing multiple hyperdense lesions see multiple hyperdense lesions in the hip so i am asking you which of the following is not a common etiology for this appearance so can anyone tell me what is the diagnosis here what is this can anyone tell me can anyone give comment uh, give me a comment about the diagnosis here what is the diagnosis seen here can anyone tell me so you have to understand that we are seeing multiple sclerotic metastasis 
see multiple sclerotic metastases. This sclerotic metastasis is also known as osteoblastic metastasis. So the sclerotic metastasis is also known as the osteoblastic metastasis. You should remember the most common type of metastasis is always osteolytic metastasis. There will be lysis of the bone. But here, instead, the bone get deposits. The bone get deposited. So it is known as osteoblastic metastasis or sclerotic metastasis. So the most common, the three common causes for osteoblastic metastasis is prostate in men breast cancer in female, then transitional cell carcinoma. So these are the three most common causes for sclerotic metastasis. Okay, keep in mind, don't forget, okay. So prostate carcinoma is the most common. You will see multiple hyperdense lesions like this in the vertebral column. So that is what is known as osteoblastic. But what happens in the opposite? That is in osteolytic is, you won't see any bright thing. There will be lysis and soft tissue deposition. So that is known as osteolytic metastasis, which is commonly seen in renal cell carcinoma or lung cancer or thyroid cancer. Okay, don't need to remember all this, but remember these two things. These are notorious for causing breast cancer. Uh, sorry, uh, osteoblastic metastasis. The thing about breast cancer is it can have both osteoblastic as well as osteolytic metastasis. Okay, so you should never confuse. It can have either osteoblastic or osteolytic metastasis. Prostate usually has osteoblastic metastasis. So whenever you, when you do a bone scan with the help of technician 99M MDP to find out metastasis, sometimes in case of this osteoblastic metastasis, what you will get, what you will get in these patients, you will get an appearance known as super scan. So what happens in a super scan is there will be intense activity in the bone. There will be intense activity in bone with no activity in kidney and soft tissues okay so there will be no activity in the kidney there will be no activity in any other soft tissues there will be intense activity in the bone so that appearance is known as super scan which was asked in our previous inact 2022 about super scan so it is seen in case of osteoblastic metastasis which is commonly seen either in prostate cancer or CA breast. So keep the concepts very clear. You should never go wrong about this. And also understand technician 99 MDP is used for doing the bone scan in India. I hope that is clear. We will move forward to other questions. So this is another question. A 20 year old male was brought with multiple episodes of seizures. And I am giving you an image with MRA brain, MRA brain with the contrast is given. What is the diagnosis? So this is another difficult question. But if you can, if you are able to rule out this, then you will easily make the answer correct. So first, what we have we are given is a T2 weighted image. See, the fluid is bright here. Fluid is bright here, T2 weighted image. And in T2 weighted image, we are seeing a black hypointense lesion, black lesion. And here it is a T1 contrast image showing a ring enhancement so the lesion is showing ring enhancement lesion is showing ring enhancement and this is mr spectroscopy this is mr spectroscopy showing an elevated peak at 1.3 ppm if you know the theory this can be lipid or lactate peak so this is a lipid peak here so these are the findings here so a t2 black hypointense lesion with the peripheral rim enhancement and a peak in lipid peak in 1.3 ppm. So what is the diagnosis? Whether it is uh, neurocystic psychosis, whether it is toxoplasma, whether it is tuberculosis, whether it is HIV. So these are the questions you should, you should understand. This is a classical image of tuberculosis or it is a tuberculoma. Okay, if you correctly say it is tuberculoma. This is tuberculoma. I will explain you. It appears black in tutuated image because of central caseous necrosis. Okay, you know it is a caseous granuloma. So caseous granuloma will appear black in tutuated image. Only the peripheral part will be active. So there will be peripheral rim enhancement. And it will be having lipid content. So there are multiple things to understand from this question. So I will tell you about MR spectroscopy. MR spectroscopy. MR spectroscopy usually how multiple peaks you will be seeing multiple peaks like this okay there will be one two three four like this there will be usually a peak at 1.3 ppm and the peak at 1.3 ppm you can call it as lipid 
if it is going down it is lactate so both lipid and lactate peak is here at 1.3 ppm then two you will see a peak that is naa there is two a so two a two stands for naa then three 3.1 3.4 that is choline and creatinine okay 3.1 3.4 choline creatinine so there are multiple peaks like this okay you should remember choline peak is seen in malignancy okay choline peak is seen in malignancy NAA peak is usually seen in normal brain, but much elevated NAA peak can be can be seen in Canavans. Can also also NA is there Canavans disease. So these are all the previous questions that has been asked about MR spectroscopy. Spectroscopy is nothing. It is an MRI sequence that help you to find out the component of the lesion. It will help you to find out the chemical composition of the lesion. Okay, it helps you to find out chemical composition of the lesion it helps you to, okay so without doing a biopsy without going into the brain we will be able to find out what content is seen within the lesion okay since tuberculosis is having multiple caseous necrosis there will be amount excess amount of lipid and lactate so we will see a peak at 1.3 ppm i hope it is clear okay canaman disease is a disease you will see naa peak at 2 ppm Usually malignancies will be having a choline peak at 3.3 ppm. Okay, 3.3 ppm. Okay, so uh, that is the concept here. So now moving forward. So that is uh, how tuberculosis will be seen. Now moving forward, we should know how other lesions will be seen. Okay, uh, neurocystis necrosis, toxoplasmosis, etc. So also remember when the patient is coming with tuberculous meningitis. What we will see is we will see basal exudates around the brain stem. So this basal exudates will be seen brightly, enhancing like this. Okay, so that is another classical features of TB meningitis. So either it be either tuberculosis can be seen as a tuberculosis tuberculoma or it can be seen as tuberculous meningitis depending upon the condition of the patient tuberculoma will be black like this it will show rim enhancement whereas tb meningitis will be having basal exudates around the brain stem okay it will be seen and the that assistance around the brain stem like ambient system um prepondent system ambient system quadrigeminal system there are multiple systems around the brain i'm not going into the anatomy but you should know and there will be tuberculous exudates it will show enhancement like this okay so that is the characteristic feature of tb meningitis can anyone tell me what is the second one there are multiple lesions in the region of young in basal ganglia so there are multiple regions in the region of basal ganglia like this seen in immunocompromised patient and if you go give contrast you will see eccentric target sign so there will be enhancement like this the eccentric appearance that is eccentric target sign what is the diagnosis we have discussed it in our previous session so it will be toxoplasmosis so you should know about everything about toxoplasma what is toxoplasma gondi what is the intermediate host what is the primary host what is the role of cat what is the treatment how the regimen of pyrimethamine and sulfur salicin is given how sulfur dies so everything you should know so uh, but radiologically what happens is there will be multiple lesions predominantly in the region of basal ganglia see multiple lesions in the region of basal ganglia and if you give contrast we will get an eccentric target sign the target part will be seen little bit away from the center that is known as eccentric target so these are the terminologies you should remember about toxoplasma so here you are seeing multiple soap bubble appear soap bubble lesions soap bubble lesions in basal ganglia so what is the diagnosis this is cryptococcus Cryptococcus will be having a gelatin capsules. So when these cryptococcus get deposited there, the, 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 and because of this gelatin capsule, we will see multiple soap bubble-like appearance in cryptococcus. You should know what is the treatment, what is the role of amphotericin, uh, all these things. You should know in cryptococcus. This is also seen in immunocompromised patients only. 
the this one is very very important which was asked in the last in last exam also so here if you are seeing a lesion with a central hypo intense area like this so if you are seeing a lesion with a central hypo intense area multiple lesions then it you can confidently make the diagnosis of you can confidently make the diagnosis of neurocystocercosis last year the question about neurocystocercosis was what, what is the absolute uh, absolute diagnostic criteria for neurocystocercosis if you want to make the diagnosis then the three things should be there uh, either you should take a piece of brain biopsy and you should show the scolex or you should score, uh, show the cystocercus larva or there should be sub uh, subretinal uh, cystocercus in ophthalmological examination or in mri brain you should see the larva with the scolex okay so you have to find out scolex and you then only you can make the diagnosis so these are the criteria we have discussed in our previous session go back and see the criteria Criteria, but this is how the star is sky appearance of neurocystocercus larva will be seen. Also, you should remember there is one staging classification called Escobar staging with four stages. You know the four stages. First stage is the secular stage, second stage is colloidal, the secular stage, third is granulo nodular stage. And fourth one is nodular calcified stage. What happens in in first stage, you will be able to see the larva with scolex. Second stage, when the larva starts to die, there will be intense inflammation in the brain. There will be intense inflammation. The patient will be symptomatic. The patient will present you with the headache, seizures, or any other presentation, depending upon the location of the lesion. And what uh, there will be intense inflammation. And then what happens is. Then the larva after the death of the larva, the, inter, in the inflammation starts to settle. That is seen in this nodular granular nodular stage, and finally it will get calcified. So sometimes you will see multiple calcifications here and there in the brain. So all these appearances can be seen. So the name of the classification is very important. That is Escobar classification for neurocystocercosis. We have discussed this in our previous recall session. Please revise that before you go to the exam. Okay. So that is about these things. Now coming to another question. So this was a case of a 33-year-old male with a history of low backache. So the patient is having low backache who come to your OPD, and you know the patient is actually B27 positive. So the question is directly straight. Uh, this is straightforward question. The patient is having ankylosing spondylitis. Okay, so ankylosing spondylitis. So which of the following images will not be seen in the patient? So you remember, in a inner CT pattern of exams, they can give you. Four different images are four options. So, and they can the examiner can waste your time. So, you should be very thorough with the most commonly asked classical images. So, if you see the first image, what you can see is I will show you. What you can see is there is ossification of anterior longitudinal ligament, ossification of posterior longitudinal ligament with a sudden break, sudden break in the anterior longitudinal anterior, anterior longitudinal ligament ossification. So, this is known as the carrot stick fracture. So. Carrot stick fracture is a classical feature of ankylosing spondylitis. Other image, we can, here you can see there is anterior longitudinal ligament calcification. There is interspinous ligament calcification, interspinous ligament calcification, which is commonly seen in ankylosing spondylitis. Here you can see bilateral sacroiliitis and uh, this and uh, and the source site formation. So all these are features of ankylosing spondylitis. Whereas in this picture, we are able to see some lesion in the psoas muscle. So the second image is psoas abscess, which is not seen in anglosing spondylitis, which is usually seen associated with tuberculosis of spine. So the, uh, answer, the option answer for the option was option B was not commonly seen in anglosing spondylitis. Anglosing spondylitis is another repeat previous year topic, very, very important. You should read all the aspects, pathological aspects, radiological aspects, treatment aspects, all the criteria and all. Remember. The first and foremost uh, investigation that can pick up ankylosing spondylitis, that is the most sensitive investigation will be MRI. It will show acute sacroiliitis. See, there is inflammation of the sacroiliac joint and the sequence that will help you to find out this will be STIR. STIR is a sequence that help you to find out acute inflammatory edema of ankylosing spondylitis. And the other signs you should remember is dagger sign see this is the dagger sign the ossification of the interspinous ligament will give you the appearance of dagger sometimes the and this ossification of interspinous ligament with this endos and this endosophyte formation like this will give you an appearance known as 
trolley track sign so you should know what is dagger sign what is trolley track sign what is carrot stick fracture all this concept you should be thorough okay then only you can make this question correct also remember so as abscess is a clinically seen in cases of tuberculosis not in cases of ankylosing spondylitis i know this is little difficult but you have to understand that these are all the com common imaging appearances of ankylosing spondylitis so match the following type of questions are repeatedly seen in aims inct exams so you should be very familiar don't uh, get it mistake so it is very easy actually okay so first is regular sign you all know where you will see regular sign okay regular sign is seen in which condition regular sign is seen in case of pneumoperitoneum okay regular sign is seen in pneumoperitoneum string of bead there will be string of bead in multiple areas but here it is seen i will tell you it is seen in case of intestinal obstruction bird peak sign can be seen in aclesia cardia or sigmoid valgus so i that is why i put here bird peak sign can be seen in sigmoid valgus and pulled up cecum everyone knows okay pulled up cecum everyone knows it is seen in tuberculosis so different signs last year also they asked about four signs and four conditions so you should be familiar with all the signs they can which they can ask that's why i have put this question so we should be very familiar i will show you the images so this is regular so first we will discuss about pneumoperitoneum first we will discuss about pneumoperitoneum so pneumoperitoneum what happens in pneumoperitoneum is there will be air inside the bowel and outside the bowel so bowel wall will be seen because of the air inside and outside the bowel so we are able to see the bowel wall because of the air inside and outside the bowel so that is regular sign this is regular sign okay regular sign and what are the other signs you should know you should know about the football sign all the named signs are important for pneumoperitoneum cupola sign this tell tail triangle sign this free air will go and outlines the ligaments so there will be falciform ligament sign uracal sign inverted v sign so there are multiple signs okay for pneumoperitoneum at least remember some of the signs so that you will make the question correct so this is another case of intestinal obstruction so what happens in intestinal obstruction means there will be obstruction at some point either because of some mass or some band or some ischemia or whatever it is there will be obstruction so there will be proximal dilatation of the bowel loops so what we will see in x ray is multiple dilated air fluid levels okay i will show you 1 2 3 Oh, five, so there are multiple dilated air fluid levels here and there. Okay. So other thing is when there is small bowel obstruction, what happens is the jejunal and ileal loops. Predominantly, the jejunal loops are filled with valvular conjunctivitis. Okay. The jejunal loops will be filled with valvular conjunctivitis. So what happens is there will be trapping of air between these valvular conjunctivitis. like this okay this there this mucosal projections will be uh, there there that is known as valvular conjunctivitis and in between this you will be seeing multiple they will see multiple uh, air fluid uh, air air getting trapped in between this so this is known as string of bead sign okay this is the string of bead sign okay this is a string of bead sign okay that is why you are getting string of bead sign in case of acute intestinal obstruction there will be air in between the valvular conjunctivitis okay so that is very very important and what you will do when you are suspecting intestinal obstruction in x ray then you can go for an ultrasound so you still will show dilated bowel loops okay ultrasound will show dilated bowel loops to call a loop as dilated then small bowel loop should be more than 3 cm large bowel loops this rule of 3 6 and 9 okay more than 6 cm and cecum should be more than 9 cm so this is the cutoff so only if the cecum is more than 9 cm i can call it as a dilated cecum because cecum is very much distensible okay that's like if a small bowel loop whether it is jejunum or ileum then it should be more than 3 cm 
and there will be absence of peristalsis there will be absence of peristalsis you will see only the to and fro movements of the food particles so if you keep the probe there you will be able to see the to and fro movements because there is obstruction you are not able the bowel is not able to go forward you will only see the to and fro movements of the to and fro movement of food okay so that is about the uh, ultrasound features then if you can do ct because ct will help you to localize the cause what is whether it is tumor or whether it is a band or whether it is adhesion whatever the cause it is ct will help you to find out the cause also it will help you to tell about vascularity viability of bowel whether the bowel is viable or not ct will tell you so all these are the things that you should remember this is how you should investigate when you are seeing a case of intestinal obstruction i hope it is clear because obstruction is very very common it's an emergency condition so they can definitely ask you about intestinal obstruction so this is an appearance of sigmoid valvulus every time you will be seeing the coffee bean image everyone will make it correct understand if you do barium enema very minima you will see a bird peak sign if you are doing a bird in swallow aplasia cardia will show you bird peak sign that is you are giving contrast to the mouth if you are going contrast to the rectum if you are seeing the bird uh, this bird peak sign it is sigmoid valvulus okay then you should know sigmoid valvulus will be a hostral that is the important x ray feature that help you to find out sigmoid valvulus and coming to ileocecal tuberculosis very very important condition there will be involvement of ic wall there will be thickening of bowel loop resulting uh, and because in chronic cases because of fibrosis and pulling there will be pulled up cecum also you should know what is flushner sign what is inverted umbrella sign inverted umbrella sign all these are very very important in ileocecal tuberculosis so in ileocecal tuberculosis what happens is there will be involvement of distal ileum ileocecal wall and cecum and because uh, there will be fibrosis and first 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 of all there will be edema and narrowing so there will be only a narrow string uh, a string like stream will be going or contrast will be going and after that further when the disease become fibrotic in because of the chronicity what happens is there will be gradual pulling up of the cecum so all this happens in cases of ileocecal tuberculosis okay tuberculosis is very very important sometimes it can be in exam they can ask you about pulmonary tuberculosis cns tuberculosis bowel that is uh, gi tuberculosis or whatever it is tuberculosis is very 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 important okay now this is another inct repeat question which we discussed in our previous class so this is a 25 year old female who came with opd with chronic low back ache on examination she had hyperpigmentation over the eyes so what is the diagnosis here that is the question so here you can, you can see you are able to see multiple intervertebral disc calcification so you are seeing intervertebral disc calcification so if you are seeing intervertebral disc calcification and examiner is giving the clue of hyperpigmentation so the answer is acronosis acronosis or alkaptonuria is a condition in which there will be intervertebral disc calcification seen okay so that is very important about acronosis you should know the biochemistical chemistry part like what is penicillin deficiency how you treat this condition all these things you should read and coming to fluorosis what happens in fluorosis the two things you have to know there will be hyperdense sclerotic bones see the bones will be sclerotic the bones will be very much bright sclerotic like this and there will be interosseous membrane calcification there will be interosseous membrane membrane calcification so that is the peculiar feature if you are seeing a elbow x ray or if you are seeing a forearm x ray with interosseous membrane calcification then you can be sure this is a case of fluorosis because it is one of the important finding then also there there can be sacro tuberous ligament calcification ligaments can get calcified because of fluor fluorine deposition so these are the things that you should remember about fluorosis now another definite question definitely they will ask you a question regarding cns infection usually in pediatric age group this is a two and a half year old child he had history came with the histo seizures so on examination the patient had microcephaly 
jaundice, hepatosplenomegaly, unilateral sensory hearing loss. So there are multiple system involvement. So you ask the mother about the perinatal history or antenatal history. So she is told she had an episode of fever in her early pregnancy. So you know the answer. This is a torch infection. You are sure about that. But you should know which torch infection result in the following findings. Okay. So you should know which torch. So if you see the image, you know this is right side of the brain. This is the left side of the brain. This is the ventricle. So you are seeing calcification in periventricular region. So you are seeing calcification in periventricular region. I told you when you are seeing periventricular calcification, it is always CMV. Okay, V4, V. So we are see, when you are seeing the periventricular type of calcification, then you should be sure that this is a case of CMV, at least for your entrance purpose, because in entrance, they will give you classic images only. What happens in toxoplasmosis is there will be multiple scattered calcification here and there, not only in the periventricular region. There will be total scattering of calcification in toxoplasma. So T40, there is totally scattered calcification. So that is how you should remember, okay, in toxoplasma. In this, our last NEET 2023, they asked you, there is bilateral temporal lobe involvement. Okay, when you are, they are asking you about bilateral temporal lobe involvement, when it is bilateral, then it is herpes simplex virus infection. So today we saw mainly multiple CNS infections. But remember, when there is periventricular calcification, when the calcification are limited to the periventricular region, that is CMV, cytomegalovirus, when it is in the totally distributed here and there, then it is toxoplasma. And when there is bilateral temporal lobe involvement, is in this classical for herpes simplex virus. So these are the points you should remember. Okay. So that is very important. Other thing is this pediatric chest X-rays with the heart. Okay, that is very, very important. So here the patient presented a baby, newborn baby, presented with respiratory distress. He's having a blood pressure of 100 bar AC. Respiratory rate is very high, 60 per minute. Patient is presenting with cyanosis. So you know this is a cyanotic heart disease. And they are giving you an image of X-ray. Okay, they are giving an X-ray image. So you are seeing a narrow mediastinal, superior mediastinal pedicle with enormously enlarged heart. This is known as the egg gone side appearance which is seen in transposition of plate vessels. Okay, so these x-rays, you should be very very thorough. You should see it again and again so that you won't waste any time for making this correct. Okay, so this is seen in TGA. TGA is having strong association with maternal diabetes mellitus. Okay, TGA is having strong association with multi maternal diabetes mellitus. That is also important. So this is TGA. Remember about TGA. This appearance, this is the classical Ego, this is the classical boot shaped heart coronary support. Boot shaped heart, right ventricular enlargement, all the things about tran TOF. Last year they asked about TOF, they gave this X ray image and they asked about tran tetralogy of palate. But they can ask you about any, congen any congenital heart disease, so be very cautious. Be very cautious. Oh, see all the images before you go. This is a box like enlarged heart seen in which condition? So this can be associated with the lithium intake in pregnancy. Okay, so this is a case of what is the diagnosis Epstein's anomaly? This is a case of Epstein's anomaly. And this is the classical snowman appearance. As for us, supra cardiac type of TAPVC. So, all the classical images, you should be very thorough, okay, as far as. So this is how you should solve these questions. You should be very thorough. You should not waste any time. You should not make it wrong. You should be very thorough with these images before your INACET. Renal masses are favorite for AIMS examiners. I don't know why, but they are repeatedly, they keep on asking about renal mass. So here, this is a case of a 30-year-old female with a hematuria, seizures. So there are two complaints. And you did a CT brain and CT abdomen for the patient. I have given you the image of CT abdomen. So which of the following can you expect in her brain? So I am asking you, see the CT abdomen image, what do you expect in the brain? So that is a simple, straightforward question. So can anyone come and me? What is the diagnosis here? Can anyone tell me what is the diagnosis here? Because the patient is having seizures, hematuria. There is a right renal mass. Always remember this is right side, this is left side. There is some right renal mass there. So what else you can expect in the brain of this patient? The question is very straightforward. Identify the syndrome, tell the diagnosis. That is all. So when you uh, when you approach, you know the left kidney. This is left kidney, pretty normal. This is right kidney. There is some mass here. 
always they compare the intensity of the mass see this intensity with this intensity this is subcutaneous fat intensity of subcutaneous fat and the lesion is seen so this is a fat containing lesion okay so you know one fat containing lesion is angiomyolipoma the name itself says angiomyolipoma angiomyolipoma is a fat containing lesion so you know which condition is associated with this fat containing lesion angiomyolipoma can be seen in a condition known as tuberous sclerosis there are two types of tuberous sclerosis ts1 ts2 you should know all those things but just remember angiomyolipoma can be seen in patient with tuberous sclerosis so why i am telling this as angiomyolipoma is intensity of this fat and this fat is same so this is fat okay if it is muscle it will be in the, this intense the muscle intensity see these are muscles muscle intensity will be there but it is still black just like the fat so it is a fat containing lesion one of the most common fat containing lesions in kidney is renal lipoma or angiomyolipoma so this is angiomyolipoma sometimes this angiomyolipoma can go undergo spontaneous rupture this spontaneous rupture is known as wanderlust syndrome all these are previous questions okay all these are previous questions you should be very thorough with this don't make it wrong okay so that's what i am telling so we will see answers optic nerve glioma will optic nerve glioma comes into tuberous sclerosis not commonly hemangioblastoma no medulloblastoma no then it is siga okay subependymal jensel astrocytoma so sir, it is subependymal jensel astrocytoma that is siga will be seen in tuberous sclerosis so the patient can have siga that is the answer okay so where you can get this optic nerve glioma that is my question why i am put this is because optic nerve glioma can be seen in one condition known as nf1 that is neurofibromatosis type 1 where you can have optic nerve glioma second option was hemangioblastoma hemangioblastoma is another brain tumor which is commonly seen in condition known as von hippel lindau disease vhl vhl can have hemangioblastoma then other thing is the third option was what medulloblastoma medulloblastoma is seen in which syndrome uh, which uh, associated with which polyposis medulloblastoma can come it can come in turcot syndrome okay turcot syndrome today we learned that medulloblastoma will be dwa positive i and b in fact abscess medulloblastoma meningioma and epidermosis so all these things you should remember okay medulloblastoma is very very important it is a tumor commonly seen in pediatric age group seen in posterior fossa in the roof of fourth ventricle all these points are very very important okay so optic nerve glioma can be seen in neurofibromatosis type 1 hemangioblastoma can be seen in von hippel lindau disease medulloblastoma can be seen in turcot syndrome and i have told you about nf1 what is the specialty of nf2 neurofibromatosis i miss it because it is the mnemonic is miss me it is a globally used mnemonic there will be multiple inherited schwannoma meningioma and ependymoma so nf2 nf2 can present with miss me that is multiple inherited schwannomas meningiomas and ependymomas okay very very commonly seen okay recently also i have got a case with the miss me, me complex okay so miss me there will be schwanno multiple schwannomas in the brain spine multiple meningiomas in the brain spine ependymomas in the brain spine etc so these are all the important symptoms and brain tumors okay just remember this just revise this so that you will be having an upper edge in your exams okay so these are very important they have been asked repeatedly okay i hope this is clear we will move forward again other symbol match the following this is a very easy question okay first is thimble bladder you know where it is seen it is seen in tuberculosis of kidney then molar tooth sign you know where it is seen it is seen in extra peritoneal bladder rupture it is seen in extra peritoneal bladder rupture adder head or cobra head appearance is seen in urethrocele and goblet sign is seen in transitional cell carcinoma so i hope this is the answer a4 yeah b3 yeah okay so this is the answer for the question okay so we will see the images one by one so this is the classical molar tooth sign see there is extra of the contrast after the rupture of bladder 
this is extra peritoneal bladder rupture where you can see the molar two sign in brain what is the name of the syndrome yeah it is jobert syndrome jobert syndrome in the brain can help this is molar two sign all these are very very important okay then this is the classical goblet sign okay this is the goblet sign seen in transitional cell carcinoma you should remember transitional cell carcinoma is a tumor that can be seen in this urothe anywhere in the urothelial tract okay it can be seen in the kidney it can be seen in the ureter it can be seen in the bladder okay so anywhere along the urinary tract you will be able to see transitional cell carcinoma and if it comes in the ureter like this this appearance is known as the goblet sign this is the goblet sign okay just remember that and see this is the classical cobra head or adder head appearance which is seen in urethrocele commonly asked as spotter don't ever make it wrong urethrocele adder head appearance is repeatedly asked and this is the fibrotic bladder with no capacity low capacity so this is the thimble bladder i have shown you the images of everything so this is the molar tooth sign this is the goblet sign this is the adder head appearance you will be able to see a snake head appearance like this adder head appearance and fibrotic bladder with less oleum low oleum low capacity that is thimble bladder i hope it is clear all these are repeatedly asked supporters so again fast because since you will be in casualty again and again since you are casualty medical officers so so 45 year old male patient to uh, may be taken to the aims casualty or wherever it is the patient will be having a blood pressure of 180 120 80 by a pulse rate of 100 per minute you did a extended fast and you got this image so what is the diagnosis what is false regarding the management so this is the liver this is the kidney i told you this is the modus and spouch okay remember the name this is the modus and spouch you are seeing what you are seeing here you are seeing free fluid in the modus and spouch you are seeing free fluid in the this is fluid so you know there is hemoperitoneum you know there is hemoperitoneum is present so what will you do so when you are seeing hemoperitoneum first of all you have to put a white board cannula you have to secure the iv line you have to start the fluid so you will start the iv fluids since the patient is stable you have to find out the organ of injury okay since the patient is stable here you have to find out because we were imagine this hemoperitoneum is because of grade 1 liver injury you don't know how to do anything just you have to start the patient on antibiotics you have to watch the patient you have to monitor the patient that's all if it is grade 1 splenic injury grade 2 splenic injury grade 3 liver injury grade 3 all these things you can manage conservatively most of the time it you have to manage the lesions conservatively so you should find out the source of the bleed so cct abdomen is extremely mandatory all anti shock measurement managements you can start because uh, that is mandatory the splenic artery embolization you don't know whether the injury is because of splenic artery or whether it is because of any other uh, renal artery or a hepatic lesions or anything only with, with ultrasound itself we can't start any uh, therapeutic procedure we have to do a cct abdomen we have to find the source of bleed we have to find the source then only you can manage so among these options this is the most apt option okay this is the most apt option so that is how and remember if the patient is fast positive and if the patient is not stable you can't wait for cct you have to do exploratory laparotomy and you have to find the and you have to do an exploratory laparotomy and you have to find the source of the bleed okay that is how you should manage a patient with fast so if the patient is fast positive and stable you how to do a cct abdomen contrast abdomen you how to find the source of bleed you should understand that you how to find from where the bleed is coming what is the grade of injury because if it is a grade 1 or grade 2 or grade 3 injury most of the times that we can manage the patient conservatively there is no need for any surgery so you how to find the source that is why you how to do cct abdomen okay when the patient is table that is the catch point okay i hope that is clear this is another very much repeat question a patient with a difficulty in swallowing came to opd barium swallow you did a barium swallow so you are getting an image find out the wrong statement regarding the following condition so i am asking you to find out the wrong statement first is so what is the diagnosis here diagnosis is straight forward it is a case of aplasia cardia this is a most common spotter repeatedly asked so 
the first option is the manometry shows absence of primary peristalsis this is the first option so th you have to understand that the post the pathology behind this is because since there is absence of this mandatory plexus in this something called this <clears throat> In the esophagus, what happens is there will be absence of primary peristalsis. So this is the first pathology that you have to remember. So that is correct. Swallowing difficulty is more for fluids. Yes, at the first in aplasia, liquid the patient will complain so swallowing difficulty more for the fluids. That is the concept. And third option is there is irregular coarse tapering of distal esophagus, leading a bird peak, bird peak appearance. Remember the appearance is bird peak, but it is not irregular. It is not coarse. It is a smooth tapering. smooth tapering all benign conditions will be having smooth tapering okay this is a benign condition you are having a smooth tapering so this option is wrong it is not irregular course irregular course tapering will be seen in malignancy that is the catch all point so it is a very smooth so the answer for this option is c and you know there is hellas myotomy or poem surgery whatever procedure you want to do you can do but the thing is the narrowing will be very irregular so very smooth and very regular okay so giving you a bird peak appearance so it is not irregular it is not cold so that is the catch hold in this point you should remember always remember the investigation of choice is very uh, the you know the gold standard investigation is manometry with biopsy okay and you can do barium swallow to see this bird peak appearance i hope i am uh, uh, this uh, you, uh, you are clear with this so this is about barium swallow of aphasia cardia you should see all the spotters if you are seeing an appearance like this what is this So here you should see the spotters of nutcracker esophagus, diffuse esophageal spasm, etc. This is uh, when you are seeing multiple irregular contractions in between, you will be seeing it in diffuse esophageal spasm. It is known as the cork screw esophagus. This is another spotter from esophagus. Okay, so barium images of esophagus is very 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 important. I hope we can also another spotter will be there. That is, you will be seeing multiple lines like this. That is known as feline esophagus okay so feline esophagus crocus corks esophagus carcinoma esophagus aplasia cardia all the four images you should see before you go to your inct this is another easy question a four weeks old male boy present male baby presented with non bilious vomiting ultrasound images are given find out the wrong statement regarding the condition so the first statement first you have to see the image you have to understand the condition here you can see this is the stomach And and here you can see this is the pyloric angle. This is the thickened pylorus. So here there is a gross hypertrophy of circular muscles of pylorus. Yes, giving you one classical sign known as the target sign in axial section. And in suggestive section, you are giving a sign called as cervix sign. Okay, cervix sign. So what happens is this is a condition condition known as the congenital hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. Here what happens is there will be gross hypertrophy of the circular muscles. So when you do ultrasound, ultrasound is the first and foremost investigation that you can do because it is <coughs> very easily available. The imaging appearance is very classical. You will be able to see the thickened and elongated pylorus like this. See, you are able to see the thickened and elongated pylorus and one protruding nipple like appearance known as the antral nipple sign. so three important signs in ultrasound is cervix sign antral nipple sign target sign in axial section all these things you can pick up in ultrasound so congenital hypertrophic pyloric stenosis can be easily picked up with the help of ultrasound keep it in mind and usg will show thickened pylorus more than 4 mm and pylorus will be elongated more than 16 mm so multiples of 4 4 4 into 4 is 16 so remember this hellers myotomy is a surgical procedure of choice that is wrong you know it is ramstedt pyloromyoplasty okay it is ramstedt's pyloroplasty that is the treatment hellers is used for aplasia so that was the catch in that so remember in ultrasound there are three signs and if you do fluoroscopy barium swallow barium imaging you will see multiple signs like caterpillar sign mushroom sign shoulder sign okay there are multiple signs in fluoroscopy so those signs were seen in fluoroscopy the three ultrasound signs will be cervix sign since it looks like the uterine cervix antral nipple sign you are able to see a projection the nipple like projection like this that is antral nipple sign and target sign in axial section i hope it is clear 
Okay, so these are the important signs you see in congenital hypertrophic pyrrhosinosis. This is the most commonly done investigation will be ultrasound LA. You will be able to make the diagnosis with the help of ultrasound LA. So another very straightforward, simple question from the theory part. A 65-year-old female, age is very important, came with a history of weight loss, abdominal pain. So MRI is done. This is a T2 weighted MRI. That is why fluid is bright. You are able to see multiple cluster of grape-like appearance like this in the region of head of pancreas. What is this? This is the serous cyst adenoma of pancreas. Okay, this is the serous cyst adenoma of pancreas, which is also known as the grandmother tumor, commonly seen in the region of head of pancreas. So all these are the points that you should remember when you go to the exam so from the question itself you can make the diagnosis because the patient is 65 year old so when a grandmother come to you with a lesion in the region of head of pancreas which is having multiple cystic appearance like this see multiple septations and cystic appearance so this is serous cyst adenoma of pancreas so that is also known as the grandmother tumor so you should know about other tumors so this is a case of a 35 year old female. Mother tumor, M4M. This is mucinous cystadenoma, which is commonly seen in the region of body and tail of pancreas. See, it is filled with mucin. So you will be seeing a unilocal cyst. Sometimes there will be calcification. Sometimes you can see ring like calcifications. So this is how mucinous cystadenoma will be seen. Other condition, you are seeing duct is dilated, the pancreatic duct is dilated with mucin. It is, it is having similar incidence for male and female. The condition is known as IPMN. Okay. Intradectal. The name itself says it is intradectal papillary mucinous neoplasm. So the duct is filled with mucin. So if you do ER scopy, you will be able to see the mucin protruding out, the bulging papilla because of protruding mucin, you will be able to see in ERCP. Another important thing, this is a 16-year-old female presenting with a large mass in pancreas. The condition is known as SPEN, which is also known as daughter tumor. So you should know what is daughter tumor, what is grandmother tumor, what is grandmother tumor. Daughter tumor is SPEN, okay. Pseudopapillary. Pseudopapillary neoplasm of pancreas, that is pain. So you should remember about mother tumor, grandmother tumor, and daughter tumor. Now coming to the other case, this is a 37-year-old male presented with weight loss, lethargy. So CCT abdomen was taken, and you are seeing a lesion like this. is very smooth lesion from the bowel wall. So what is the diagnosis? If you read the option, you can understand the diagnosis. It is This lesion is believed to be arising from the interstitial cells of Kajal. So you have to understand that lesion is just, just will be seen as a very smooth exophytic lesion like this. It will be very smooth because it is usually a benign lesion. So it will be very smooth. You know, cyst will be just will be positive for CD117 and DOG1. Adjun chemo, you can start imagining for just it is associated with the carnase complex. Is it true or false? Here the catch is. It is not carnase complex, it is carnase triad, okay, because carnase complex comprises of cardiac myxoma, skin pigmentation, etc. Whereas carnase triad comprises of just extrapulmonary paraganglioma, pulmonary chondroma, It is carnase triad, okay, not carnase complex. So that is why it is wrong. Carnase complex is another condition. Carnase triad is another condition. Both are different. Uh, both are very much different. So you should be very thorough with carnase triad and the features of carnase triad, okay. So this is how just is seen in CT. It will be very smooth. It is associated with the dog one CD117. You can start the Martin for the patient. All these are correct. The wrong statement was associated with association with carnage complex. Carnage complex is associated with the cardiac myxoma as well as skin pigmentation anomalies like that. Other thing is liver lesions. Last year they asked about 
calcified liver lesion in a non contrast ct it was highlighted cysts so they can ask you anything about liver lesion this year because previous year topics will be repeated so topics are very very important so you should know so this is a 35 year old male with the recurrent episodes of abdominal pain came to you so you did a ct abdomen so for all liver lesions what you have to do is you have to do a triple face CT. That is the first point you have to understand. Whether it is for exam or for a practical purpose, whenever you are dealing with the CT, or sorry, whenever you are dealing with a liver patient and there is a focal liver lesion, you have to do triple phase. So it consists of arterial phase, portal venous phase, and delayed phase. I am repeating this multiple times because it is as much important. That is that much important. Okay. So in this phase for this patient, neurotensin levels was normal. So that is a very important clue. What is the most probable diagnosis for this patient? So this is the question here. So this is the arterial phase image. This is the venous phase image. So you can see what in the uh, you can see is you can see a central non-enhancing stellate area. Okay, star-like central non-enhancing area. So that is the star-like the scar. Central stellate scar. We what we call it is this central stellate scar. So when you see central stellate scar, you can remove the option of hepatic adenoma. You can remove the option of hemangioma. So the thing is, central stellate scar will be seen either in FNH, that is focal nodular hyperplasia, or in fibrolamellar variant of HCC. So you should know how you should differentiate between focal nodular hyperplasia and fibrolamella within the carcinoma. So here it is very easy because neurotensin level of this patient is very normal. So you can remove the option of fibrolamellar variant. So this is focal nodular hyperplasia. Remember why the differentiation important is very important because FNH, focal nodular hyperplasia is just a hamartoma. Hamartoma. So this is a benign condition. You don't need to just watch follow-up is enough. No treatment is needed. Okay. That is why the imaging differentiation is that much important because if if you are getting an FNH, then you don't have to do anything. Just keep on following after one year or two years or three years. That is enough. Okay. But if it is fibrolamellar HCC, it is HCC. You have to treat. You have to do surgery. You have to give chemo. Hold this because the treatment is entirely different. That is why they are repeatedly asking you how to differentiate between FNH and FL FLC in imaging. Okay. So this is how a fibrolamellar variant will be seen. Okay. Fibrolamellar will be seen as central stellate scar. Around 65% of the cases will be having calcification. See, there is calcification here. So if in exam you are seeing scar with calcifications then it will be fibrolamellar variant of cancer. Also, AFP level, alpha fetoprotein levels will be normal, whereas neurotensin levels will be high. So this is how you should difference, differentiate. Okay, So you can do a neurotensin level. If the neurotensin level is high, then it is fibrolamellar variant of HCC. But imaging-wise, you have to understand that. I told you, focal nodular hyperplasia is made up of is a hamartoma. Okay, it is a hamartoma. So the scar is made up of reticulo endothelial cells. That is the pathology. Okay, it is made up of reticulo endothelial cells. Whereas the scar in FLC is just fibrous tissue. It is just fibrous tissue. There is nothing. The only fibrosis is there. Okay. So that is why the differences will come. Okay. So if you do a T2 weighted MRI image, if you do a T2 weighted MRI image, what you will see is the scar of FNH will be bright. It will be bright like this. Okay. But the scar of fibrolamellar cancer will be very black because it is made up of fibrous tissue. I, I already told you fibrous tissue is a lazy cell. So it won't take up any it won't have be any enhancement. So it will be black like this. So MRI can help you to differentiate. See the MRI image. So, okay, the MRI, which is T2, it will be black like this. And I told you there will be usually less calcification, but there can be spoke of calcification in CT. So this is how CT will help you to differentiate. Okay, multiple specs of calcification can be seen in FLC. And other important thing is you can do technician 99 sulfur colloid. Sulfur will be taken up by the reticulo endothelial cells. You should know the reason. Then only you can make it correct. Okay, you can uh, you can keep on by hearting things. Okay, I, I told you this focal nodal hyperplasia is simply hematoma. It is made up of reticulo endothelial cells. Since there is reticulo endothelial cells, they will take up the contrast. 
so so they will take up the sulfur chloride so it will be it will be sure take up of sulfur chloride but since it is made up of fibrous cells this fibrous cells will not take up the sulfur chloride so there won't be any sulfur chloride uptake in flc so that is how you differentiate between fnh and flc so one point with ct one point with mri one point with the nuclear scan okay you should know all the three points then only you can make the diagnosis any of this can be intermixed and asked in exams so you should be very very careful so we can move forward and see other hepatic lesions very the hepatic lesions are very important the triple phase ct is very important you know classical hcc i have already told you hcc is supplied by hepatic artery that is the key concept here hepatocellular carcinoma is supplied by the hepatic artery so it will show enhancement in arterial phase enhancement in arterial phase see that is known as arterial phase hyper enhancement apha arterial phase are hyper enhancement see this image this is a, a hepatocellular carcinoma this is the arterial phase the contrast is in the aorta so this is an arterial phase what happens is the see the hepatic artery is supplying the lesion so the lesion is appearing bright comparing to the normal liver this is the normal liver which is appearing black the lesion is appearing bright since it is supplied only by the hepatic artery by the time of venous phase the contrast will be gone from the lesion so it is of similar intensity in portal venous phase both the intensities looks almost similar and in delayed phase you are not able to see the enhancement at all so there is rapid washout so if you are seeing arterial phase hyper enhancement that is aphe hyper enhancement and rapid washout then it is hcc so according to the why it is important so according to the new guidelines if you are seeing arterial phase hyper enhancement with rapid washout that is lyrats for you know there is a classification like lyrats there is lyrats for in imaging plus elevated alpha fetoprotein levels then there is no need for biopsy you can directly start sorafenib as or surgery okay that is the thing so you don't need to do any biopsy if the imaging appearance is classical and the patient is having elevated alpha fetoprotein levels that is why the imaging appearance is very very important so the lesion should have arterial phase hyper enhancement just like this so that is about hepatocellular carcinoma and uh, now moving forward to another important thing here if you see in arterial phase the lesion is having peripheral discontinuous enhancement peripheral discontinuous enhancement in venous phase the portal venous phase the enhancement the size of the enhancement is increasing so there is filling in the contrast is filling in in delay the contrast appears this much again filling in so arterial phase peripheral no, discontinuous nodular enhancement with the filling in in other phases is classical of which lesion this classical of nothing else classical of hemangioma this very much classical for hemangioma hemangioma is the most common seen liver lesion okay most common liver benign liver lesion that is most commonly seen liver lesions so that is why they are repeatedly asking because see sometimes that it can be multiple and uh, it can be associated with many symptoms like kasabnerit syndrome so like that so it is very important so what happens is arterial phase there will be discontinuous nodular peripheral enhancement with the filling in because the central part is made up of fibrous tissue which are very lazy cells which i have already told you they will take up contrast only in very late stage so slow by slowly slowly the contrast will come to the center that happens in hemangioma so how hcc is seen how hemangioma is seen how fnhc is seen how flc is seen all these are very important how hydrocystis hydrocystis will be calcified okay so these are the classical appearances of all these lesions you should know it very thoroughly now renal infections are very important 67 year old female with a history of type 2 diabetes mellitus and recurrent uta came to you so you did the cct appearance you are giving a classical appearance okay you are seeing multiple dilated calyxes and one calculi so there is an obstructive calculi this is the calculi uh, with multiple dilated calyxes like this giving the classical appearance what is this appearance this is the bear po appearance okay so this is the what is the diagnosis here the diagnosis is very straightforward but it is xpgn xpgn stands for sando granulomatous pyelonephritis so it is a renal infection 
so this is stands for xantho granular matter spironephritis what happens is because of this stone there will be chronic obstruction so what happens is the calyces will start getting dilated so there is obstructive calculi there will be dilated calyces all correct what happens is because of the chronic obstruction the renal function will come down okay that is also correct so the wrong option is only this streptococcal infection you know usually it is gram negative infection either proteus or e coli these are the common causes of infection in sando granulomatous pyelonephritis okay and there will be microscopic in pathology there will be microscopic fat deposits in kidney that is why it is known as sando fat sando granulomatous pyelonephritis so the concept is very clear it is not the streptococcal infection it is either the proteus mirabilis or uh, e coli infection is the most common cause of sando granulomatous pyelonephritis i hope this is clear that is why it is wrong so this is another classical spotter okay 45 year old male with uncontrolled hypertension so young male with uncontrolled not young but a male with uh, uncontrolled hypertension came to your opd you are running an intravenous urogram you then you inject the contrast you take x-ray image you will get an intravenous urogram image what is wrong about this condition see you can see there is multiple splaying of the calyces okay so you should make the diagnosis with the health image so this is known as the what spider like appearance spider leg appearance in ivu is seen in none other than adpkd there are two types of adpkd type 1 type 2 and type 1 is because of mutation of chromosome number 16p it is correct berry aneurysm yes berry aneurysms can be seen in brain yeah that is correct cysts can be seen not only in kidney but also in liver pancreas arachnoid membrane that is also correct this appearance is not pain fresh appearance this is spider leg appearance okay so it is spider leg appearance so that is wrong here so you should know that the pain the brain brush appearance is seen in what condition medullary sponge kidney okay so what happened this is adpkd ct image see multiple cystic lesions replacing the parenchyma ultrasound it is having this appearance also known as what is swiss cheese in tom and jerry like cartoons you will be seeing cheese like this right so this is the swiss cheese appearance multiple time repeat question and autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease multiple cysts will replace the kidney what happens is not only the kidney will be affected it can affect liver pancreas brain there will be very very aneurysms in the brain what happens is uh, there will be uncontrolled hypertension for the patient because of the renal involvement the patient can go for end stage renal disease cardiac attacks etc then edh sdh sah you know there will be definitely one question definitely they will ask one question regarding this either it is neat or inact whatever it is they will definitely ask a question about mrh because when you are in casualty definitely at least one or two cases you will definitely get of head trauma in india so find out wrong statement regarding the condition so the patient was found unconscious in the footpath so they took uh, the patient to you so since the patient is unconscious you ordered a ct brain you are getting an image like this so you should know what to do so the first option is it arises because of direct trauma to the brain see this looks like an idli here so you know the uh, this answer diagnosis is very clear this edh so edh you know it is extra dural so imagine this is dura this is the dura and this is the skull so it is outside the dura so since it is outside the dura it it is very difficult for this extra dural hemorrhage to cross the suture line so that is correct the most common vessel involved is middle cerebral artery associated skull bone fractures can be seen so this is correct this is correct this is correct you should remember edh is most commonly because of not middle cerebral artery it is middle meningeal artery so don't get confused there don't get confused in exam edx which looks like idli will not cross the suture line it is not because of middle cerebral artery it is because of middle meningeal artery it is not mca but it is mma it is because of middle meningeal artery so you should know the difference between edh sdh and sh edh you know uh, we told it is biconvex in shape it is because of middle meningeal artery it can't cross the suture line remember this is the swirl sign seen in edh which indicates 
active bleed because of rod retraction there will be active bleed so this is the swell sign very important sdh we know it looks like banana it is concave or convex in shape it is because of the tearing of bridging cortical veins since it is within the dura since see since sdh is within the dura since it's hds is within the dura it can go like this it can it can go like this okay so since it is within the dura it can cross the suture lines sh you know sh sub arachnoid hemorrhage it is because of either uh, any aneurysms or trauma so cortical arteries and veins are involved the important thing about sh is the patient can die because of vascular spasm vascular spasm irritating the spinninges resulting in the death of the patient so sh that is the important thing so sh will be seen as bleed filling the circle spaces so you should never get this wrong you should know how edh is seen how sdh is seen how s a h is seen see this images again you go for fr definitely one question will come edh when it is causing the mass effect like this you have to put a bar hole and you have to evacuate that if sh is also sdh is also causing this you have to put a bar hole and evacuate sh usually requires coiling of the aneurysm because it is usually because of aneurysms so you need to coil or clip the aneurysm according to the condition of the patient So, 46-year-old female female presented with yellowish discoloration of the sclera and with a prurite. So, the patient is having some sort of obstructive jaundice or some sort of jaundice is seen, and which are find out the uh, so the, he is subjected to this investigation. Find out the investigation, find out the finding. That is the question. So, is it is is this is ERCP? Is this is MRCP? Is this is called tissue collagenogram? That you have to understand. So, you should understand that this you are seeing this one is the CBD. this is the mpd so you are seeing two decks dilated so this is known as the double duct sign this is the double duct sign you are seeing two decks double dilated so either it is crcp or mrcp you know this not do are wrong so you see this is fluid filled structure is seen bright so what is this this is mrcp this is magnetic resonant cholangiopancreatography mrcp is nothing it is just simple mri there is no need for contrast there is no need for any invasive procedures just do mri just to mrcp is nothing it is simple mri is heavily t2 weighted images just take heavily t2 weighted image so the fluid will be bright fluid is bright it is heavily t2 weighted so the fluid is bright here okay so that is what you get in mrcp the fluid will be bright in mrcp you do there is a non invasive procedure so this is double deck sign in mrcp other important things is this is cholelithiasis see this is the gallstone this is the mr mr image showing cholelithiasis here there is a stone here giving the classical meniscal sign in mrcp in this case in mrcp so mrcp remember it is t2 weighted so the fluid is bright fluid is bright also it help you to find the anatomy of adjacent structures see this is the liver this is the gall bladder bowel loops so by doing this mri abdomen you will be able to see the entire anatomy there if there is any lesions in the pancreas or anything else is there you will be knowing okay so this is a the double deck sign is usually occurring because of some mass lesion in the region of head of pancreas or in the distal cbd so everything can be made out with the help of mrct but one disadvantage is is we can't take biopsy we can't take biopsy because it is non invasive the patient will be lying in the mri couch you can't do anything you can't do any biopsy you can't get an hpe that is the advantage of ercp but ercp involved it is ercp is invasive see this is double deck sign in ercp this is the cbd this is the mpd this is the right hepatic duct this is the left hepatic duct the anatomy is clear this is the ercp this endoscope so you will be seeing all this but what uh, what is what are the disadvantages of ercp is it is invasive you take x rays so there is radiation exposure there is radiation exposure and what happens is 
so radiation exposure is there it is invasive it can result in pancreatitis okay procedure associated can be associated with pancreatitis all these are the complications of ercp but the advantage is this gold standard so you can take hp that is the advantage of ERCP. So how to differentiate ERCP and MRCP in images? ERCP, you will be able to see this endoscopic tube. Also, it is involving X-rays. Okay, so you will not be able to see the adjacent structures clearly. The X-ray appearance will be seen this in X-ray radiograph. It is radiograph. Okay, but MRCP will be clear and you will be able to see the structures or the only the fluid field structures like this beautifully. So that is the advantage of ERCP and MRCP. You should never get it wrong in your exams. ERCP, you will be able to take the biopsy. You can retrieve the clot. Oh, sorry, you can retrieve the stone using dormia basket or something like that so it can be the therapeutic as well as 